equipped means having the book, having a paper and pen so you can take notes, preferably having done the reading, but maybe not. It doesn't matter. But knowing how to use OBS so that if you are taking lead on the recording responsibility in one of the breakout rooms, it's going to be good. You'll be able to do it. We'll be an elite uh, team of people who are able to disperse into 10 different rooms. And every one of those rooms can be recorded and added into the forum. Imagine, just imagine, in 45 minutes, we could produce 10 hours of content. All right there, boom, done. And all of us got to say what we actually wanted to say. And one weirdo who we respect and appreciate so much is going to actually be obsessive enough to go through all of it, but it's there. It's at least, at least it was done and we did it right now for now, there's not that many of us. And so it, we don't even have to worry about it. But uh, the thing I'm worried about is having at least two, preferably three people who are here, who are able to record what goes on in that breakout room. And then that person will upload it to a YouTube channel. I don't care if you make a new YouTube channel and keep it all a secret and keep it all unlisted, or if you put it out publicly on your channel, the 5 billion dances or whatever, I don't care. Like just make it accessible to the people you did it with. And it, what, and you know, for this stuff, it can be public. I don't care. I, 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 I guess in this case, we should probably go ahead and double check with people who are present Nance, but at least make it accessible for people who are in the totality and infinity discord. And with that, I'm going to close out. Thank you, everybody. There we go. Dude, the on the main recording is done on the, on the topic of having a legion of proficient misfits, uh, like having us all able to use OBS, having us all able to use zoom or Google meet, or Microsoft Teams, or the Discord app itself, whatever. I, I like that's something that, like, we've talked about for a long time. Getting people set up on it, um, because it's not that hard, but but it is like a barrier to entry. Um, yeah. But like for for anyone here, just bug the shit out of us. Like, if it's something you want to do, just bug like DM like, hey. Help me get it set up because it doesn't take it doesn't take that long. And once you have it set up, it's easy enough to do. And then you can you can lead your own exegetical readings. You can lead your own. You can fucking live stream. Like you can be like, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna take my notes for myself, and I'm gonna live stream it. Not because you want to be a a creator. Like fuck all that shit. But because it's a it's a resource. Like it it genuinely does help out everyone else going through this shit to um to see other people struggling with the content but also to to get their insights um yeah it's it's an aspiration that i think we we really need to pursue instead of just talking about it because we've been talking about it for so long it was sasar got me to finally do a tutorial on it it's like I was always going to do a tutorial on it, but it was like having a concrete other who's actually like, yo, I want to do it right now. How do I do it? And I was like, oh shit, I can just record that. And then it's done. Perfect. Like that made it so easy to do. And so it's like, the question is a gift. You know what I mean? Like it does, uh, questions can supercharge our activities. Like sometimes a person asking a question on a given day is the difference Sorry, I had to fix that. A person asking a question on a given day can be the difference between that day being kind of just like a mundane day and being an awesome day. And in terms of productivity, like uh, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to do some administrative stuff and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Someone asks a really good question. I write a paper. People have an argument. I write three, pap three papers. I got a blog post. I got a chapter. Fuck. I just wrote a book. Like those kinds of things spill out of you when you're, I don't know, at least it spills out of me, you know? So it's like, uh, having Cesar go, okay, how do I actually do that? Dave for real though, actually show me. I was like, Oh shit. Now it exists. Right. So that tutorial is in part 
uh, what is it? Level one or le exegetical organizing. It's a, it's a post. You can find it as a post there. Yeah. We, 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 we will probably do a few more tutorials for specific things, stuff on method and, and digital literacy and, and basic etiquette over time. And that'll all get added to a playlist called, um, I don't know, acclimating to TU or something like that. Uh, I, I restarted the recording halfway through Nance talking, uh, just, just by the way. And so, uh, I, I will, uh, record this for a minute. Nance can record it. Um, after I leave, if you're down, Nance should be, are, are you down for a hallway conversation for a little bit? Yeah, I got a bit, I got, uh, shit to do, but I can push it off for a bit. Okay, sick. And then of course, uh, he can always hand that off to someone else as well. Um, I almost want to just say, let's all go over how to do this OBS thing right now, honestly. Um, like, Christopher, do you not? You don't know how? You still don't know how? No, I haven't. I know how to, like, record on Zoom and, like, upload to YouTube, but I don't know anything about OBS. Sweet. Well, it's like you download it, you open it, you make a scene, you make a source you click record and then you have it it is that simple but the video i did with cesar i mean we go into some extra stuff like cropping stretching moving adding layers um but it really is as easy as like you make a scene you make a source you click record and so maybe what we need is like a version of the tutorial where it's like record something yourself in five steps and then it's like literally just five steps. And then like all of the other stuff can be extra for later. But it's like, if you're in a, so it's like being able to record with Zoom is fine. But like, if you don't have premium, you can't go over for, you can't go over 45 minutes, right? Google Meet is a good enough alternative for people that, that don't have Zoom premium. If you want to um, like have exegetical meet, or exegetical readings or sessions or stuff like that. Um and Discord, like the Discord app itself, you can do, you can read and share screen and share activities and shit like that. Um, I think like that end of it is less important than just OBS. OBS is free. It's open source. Um, it regularly gets updates. And once you get it set up, you can kind of use whatever platform works best for you. Um, and then just record in OBS. Uh, for for posterity dude it's nice it's nice to be able to record anything you want on your screen for free and yeah. then this and then and then once you've learned that there's only a couple other steps to go to streaming if you ever want to or there's only a couple extra steps to go to doing a screen share and then having the text up on the screen and doing an exegesis like it's like there's like this baby step to being able to record and then there's like a couple more steps that I went over with Cesar to being able to do the exegetical. And then there's only a couple other steps to being able to do a stream if you so desire. And it's like, look, a lot of people might not want to, but it's like the point of digital literacy isn't – like it's like school is not like teaching everyone to be literate so that everyone can do everything they're learning. It's just giving you the basic tools so that if you want to, in a spur of a moment later, you are so empowered, right? Well, and it, it, it multiplies the efficacy of, like, we're all here for a reason. We're all here because we're getting something out of it. Uh, or maybe we are, we, this is our weird fetish. I mean, okay, more, more power to you. But, like, in theory, we're all, <laughs> we're all getting some type of spiritual nourishment out of this. Um, and, y like, to be able to set up similar like structures and kind of do it on your own when you like when the fancy strikes you as opposed to waiting around for the rest of us to be able to come together and and like um having the ability to say hey let's jump on a call and let's let's read together like that's that's a 
that's an awesome fucking skill to have. Um, you don't you don't have to only study when everyone else here is available. Like you can you could do it on your own too. So I I definitely advocate for it. With that. What's up? P floor is kind of just open for whatever. It's free for all. I have some questions of uh, notes I took during your lecture, Dave. Sweet. Let's see. Do, do you want the question on um, the other choosing us, uh, war and interiority, or playground justice? So I feel like the other choosing us is like this question I mainly raised so that I could get us thinking about it because I don't know that Levinas actually does anything with that. I'm not sure that he ever gets at what is involved in that. And so I put forward a couple of my own ideas and what he might say. And it, to me, that's all very like, I'm a subjective worm. Don't, take too seriously what I'm saying when I'm talking about that. I'm, I'm, I, I think it's an important question and he's not able to answer for himself. And so we all kind of have to think, well, what would he say? But so, I mean, if you have a comment on that, then that's cool. But I, I kind of want to do the war and interiority one, especially. And then of course, if you've got stuff on the schoolyard bully of a hundred percent, but yeah, no, I'm war and interiority is like where I'd want to go first. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, you brought up the point of the uh, of of it kind of being like a, a question you have, and actually, I think it is a question I have about this. The other choosing us because I thought of something that Mikey has said in the past regarding Lacanian desire, where he says, "We don't choose desire; desire chooses us, and we can choose to double down." on desire choosing us. It's kind of like the agency that we might have in the Lacanian sense. And so I was like, oh, I wonder, this is just a question that I don't think we can answer right now of what would it look like if uh, we don't choose the other, the other chooses us, yet if we decide to double down on that choosing of the other that happens, um, what we can speculate happens uh, when that decision gets made, but um, I'm 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 glad leaving that a question for now. That's something that we can keep returning back to. And uh, the one about the war and interiority part, I I guess I have I'm not sure if my reading so far. I think I've gotten up to page sixty even uses the word exteriority just yet, but I did start to see this word interiority. And this is kind of my idea of, of what I've understood so far is that Levinas says war, war basically creates history, which we could say as like a, a collection of totalizing facts. And history sacrifices interiority is um, something that Levinas says, oof, what page is it? Somewhere in like the 50s. And so if history sacrifices interiority, this, this thing of like, uh, I understand interiority to mean basically like your own personal time as opposed to objective time then Levinas says um, the present work proposes another option at the bottom of page 57. So he's saying that he wants to think about something other than what we think of as objective history and instead look at the interiority history of maybe I put it in my own words as Levinas wants to look at the personal experiences of people during a war as opposed to looking at the textbook facts that 
of war of like this war happened on this date these many people died you know very very quantifiable things and levinas is saying but there were personal experiences that were taking place in in like a inter interiority history and i'm so i'm just wondering if uh that starts to seem like other people's interpretation of or you know at least your interpretation of what history is in relation to interiority yeah that's really good and i wish that i had even talked about it a bit more in the lecture but I think my new approach here on the whiteboard is going to prove like really fucking helpful for these. So it's like, yeah. Um, I realized when I didn't have the whiteboard handy, what I wish I had, right? Like when I was in Canada, I was like, so I did it here today. And it's like, you notice that I have like these terms and then I have like pay, basically what I take to be essential page numbers next to those terms. And I don't have interiority page numbers up there right now. And so what I'm going to do is I put some question marks beside it. Yeah, it definitely starts to take place by around page 57. I'm not sure if it shows up, starts to show up earlier in the text. But yeah. 57 is where I'm pulling a lot of this from. Yeah. And so like, uh, my my short answer before turning to the page is just that interiority is a different kind of time. It's also a different dimension. It's also in a lot of ways, the opposite of being an anonymous number in an accounting book, right? It's a, uh, it's the difference between somebody saying, well, 46 million grandmas have died in the X amount of time. And you being like, I just lost my Nana. Like that's, it's just like, it's that different. Right. And you, and you going, I, I did, or I did not have a relationship with her. And, you know, it's like, there's something profoundly human in this latter example. And in that former example, the sort of sociologist, like the, the worst version of econ economics or sociology would be just like this sort of blunt, listing off of statistics without like any serious attention to the concrete um, lives and attending to like <laughs> attending to allowing them to attend to their own manifestation. Right. So it's like you as a metaphysician or sociologist have like this responsibility to, to instead of just listing off a bunch of facts and, and statistics to instead go out, and actually try to get to know the kinds of people that you're talking about, right? And uh, and the, the the better the sociology or metaphysics, the better will be the research instruments that you're using in in their and by research instrument we just mean a questionnaire usually in sociology. So it's like you're you're which is just the most pompous. Oh, we're scientists and technicians when really you're just asking questions, guys. But they call it a research instrument. And the I guess the reason it, it does have to be thought of as an instrument is because, well, like you can hurt people with an instrument, right? Like there, there's a possibility you can do it right, you can do it wrong, you can make it better or worse. And uh the 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 example I went to last week was like uh Bordeaux talks about like sociologists who go up to people and ask them like what their opinions are on these different class categories. Do you think you belong to the bourgeoisie or the working class? Like it, it's like you're taking concepts that come out of theory and the scholarly research of someone who has scholae and then you're going out and then you're basically imposing that on a person and getting them to conform to it. It's a, it's a question that, at, that forces specific kinds of answers. And those kinds of answers you're getting from those research subjects are not the kinds of answers you would have gotten if you went to them a bit more open-handed, trying to see what are their concerns right now? How do you think about things? And you don't bring your own concepts and categories and impose them into the situation, right? 
I love that Bourdieu like obsesses on this. It's something he comes back to over and over again throughout the years of the the seminar that he was giving. Um, and it goes really well with Levinas because I think that he thinks philosophers are doing that exact same thing, except they don't even go to the people. You know, at least the sociologist like goes and asks people, but it's like, no, but but the philosopher just sits there in the chair and supposes people are this way or that way. Um, interiority is a radical break with this alien accounting. Um, and it's all the things I have up on the whiteboard. It's this radical separation. It's impossible to really, it's, it's impossible to ever really get to the bottom of, of a person. Um, even if I were to ask them a bunch of questions exhaustively for weeks on end, I, I, I can't totalize that person because they could make a radical rupture with who they've been a week later. Um, so it's like, the, you know, it's, it's the interiority speaks to the depths of possibility and the height of their nobility or their dignity. Um, and that height is in part just the fact that they're, they're so radically transcendent that we can never even get them into our grasp. And I use the example of, you know, Hannibal Lecter, his power trip is getting other people so much in his grasp that now they are in his stomach. It's like, that's grasping the other, but the Levinasian response is that other is not in you. You've actually, they've still escaped you. You still don't have possession of them. You still, you, you, you can take a person's dignity away. You can even take away their life, but you cannot possess them. And even if you could turn them into your little meat puppet that barks and says, I'm an ugly dog, like you've not conquered, you don't, you've not, you've not, there's, there's parts of them escaping, right? And in fact, if you completely control another person, um, if then, then you, in a sort of sense, you've you've closed off their own access to their interiority, but that doesn't mean it's not there, right? And war says you're either with us or against us. You're either serving us or you're serving the enemy. And so, like, it's the most to totalizing thing possible. And and politics within representative democracies turns everything into a state of war at the discursive level, at the level of identification. And so like, we're starting to feel the heat and the it's, it's ramping up right now, you know? Oh, was it 50? You said it's 50, 52, 56. Um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, what I'm referencing specifically is at the bottom of page 57, the last paragraph. But okay. I do see that okay. interiority, the word comes in at least on page 55. Mm. Uh, I think the first time he says it is when he says thought and interiority is this radical rupture back on like 40 something. But he just uses it. He doesn't really define the term there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, dude, like right, right there on page 57, um, when he's talking about history, like how, how history, uh, but if refusal to be purely and simply integrated into history would indicate the continuation of life after death or its preexistence prior to its beginning in terms of the time of the survivor, then commencement and end would in no wise have marked a separation that could be characterized as radical and a dimension that would be interiority. Um, and then he goes, separation is radical only if each being has its own time. That is, it's interiority. So it is like, like interiority is like the, yeah, the alienness of, the world or like how from the perspective of the world you are the alien alien um, anthropologist yeah we're all alien anthropologists <laughs> dude, man dude yes the theory underground school of alien anthropology i like it it's got a good ring to it <laughs> um 
Yeah, the separation is radical only if each being has its own time, that is, its interiority. And this is close to when he's talking above, right above. Yeah, Husserl nests, he nests interiority, interior time within objective time, which is obviously like the properly scientific thing to do. Now, Husserl still thinks that he can nest interiority within objectivity and still come out on top, prioritizing the human over instrumentalization and everything. And Husserl is the sort of godfather of that whole project. And that's what phenomenology is all about. But Levinas is saying, nope, he didn't go far enough. And interiority is a radical rupture. It's a literal different dimension. And a dimension, just think about, like, if you haven't watched videos of, like, the the flat earthers, they're called flatlanders versus, you know, like, the, the, everything's on a one-dimensional you know, it's like, it's just a dot along a line where you got the two dimensional, that's the flatlander running around. And it's just, it's like the, it's like the, it's like the life of an ant sort of, right. If you imagine the, the ant can only see in that horizontal grid. Uh, but then you add the third dimension and oh shit, everything opens up. And so we've been flattened by the historiographers is what he's saying. And the third dimension is not this, it's not, it's not, analogous to the dimension of objective time. It's the third dimension is opened up by interiority and the height of the other's transcendence outside of us. Um, and that shit cannot be flattened within this two-dimensional um, space of, of uh, physics and history, of natural sciences and social sciences. I take this to be like his... You know, I I always bring it back to Trotsky saying that, you know, to the garbage can in history with you, then bitch. Like that's what Trotsky said when somebody like leaves the the Soviet Council, like the the Central Committee. Um he's like, Well then, you know, basically saying like you're irrelevant then, you're disposable then, you don't belong to history. History we can either serve history and, and the communist project or or you're trash. And Levinas is saying yeah, no, well, outside of whether you're a communist or a Nazi or a black, white, or Jew, like it doesn't matter. Like there is uh outside of like the side you're on or the position you occupy in the field or the 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 way that you do or do not uh uh play into a stereotype or or a set of sort of statistical uh, outcomes. No, outside outside of and beyond and before all of that. You've got these depths to you, this potential radical interiority that is inex it is inherently inaccessible to the poet, to the artist, to the scientist, the philosopher, to the sociologist. It is inaccessible. And so all we can do when trying to poeticize or analyze the other um, is come to that other in a super possessive, assumptive way an overbearingly hubristic confident way or in a way that's like, no, nah, there is like a definite something there in it. And it is definitely also going to escape my grasp. Um, but that's not the same as saying it's, it's, uh, it's mysticism and that we're just trying to say something in language that we can't say with language. He is actually saying it in language and he's really good at saying it in language. And you can say infinity in language and saying infinity and compre comprehending infinity is paradoxical and there are limits to it, but even though we can't fully comprehend it, we can nonetheless understand it. And so even though we can't fully comprehend the radical exteriority of the other or have our own radical interiority understood by the or, or comprehended by the other, though comprehension breaks down, there's a kind of understanding that is possible for him. And he he uh he italicizes it. And the French word for it is entende, I think. It's on 34. It's entend. It's entend on 34. Understands in italics. Uh, so we can understand, even though we will not be able to grasp or fully grasp or comprehend. And so understanding is the hand open and comprehending is the squeezed fist that's possessing.
but I got to go guys. And I hope that you'll keep going and I'm going to go upload this into the forum and hopefully Nance will have a longer version of it that can follow later. And I really appreciate that question because it's a really good question. And I'll just say, yeah, what you'll be reading next week, you're going to move into, um, you, I think there'll be more exteriority next week, but the, the, the part where we're really going to get into exteriority and, and like the word itself will really come into play. will be in section three. So we finish out section one this week, next week. Well, we won't get to section three. I don't think in August, but yeah, um, that's the section three is called exteriority in the face. And the subtitle of totality and infinity is an essay on exteriority. So it's like, it's a really good question because it's like the most important word outside of totality and infinity itself. He's saying totality and infinity is the name of an essay about exteriority. So we could say exteriority is the subject of the book itself, but all right, I got to, I got to bounce. And so uh, thanks guys. Peace. I'm uh I'm very excited. Oh, what did I do? Oh, that's why. Um to get into like when he's talking about language as Oh, what the hell was it? The, the signifier, the sign, the sign doesn't signify the signified whatever, like that whole part. I like it a lot. Because um, I think, I don't know, like I have my pet hypothesis that it is the way we use language that is the root of all evil in the world. <laughs> um, and I like him kind of problematizing our relationship to language and the signifier the signified yeah i like no it's not the tree it, it's me telling you about that tree i like that i think that's that's the proper approach um and then talking about the algorithmic reproduction um yeah i think i think language operates that way i think language operates as an algorithm and i think it forces us to think algorithmically and kind of honoring this infinity is maybe a line of flight from from the algorithm um so i'm very excited about that i think like it's almost like dave says like if if it's too late then it's surely too late to act like it's too late like if we're already out of time then we don't we can't act like we're out of time like we we need to act and i think we are approaching a like a point a pivotal moment in history um and i don't know like may, maybe this is something uh this infinity could serve as like a ground for for new theories that would actually help us save the world i don't know because surely you know marxism didn't do it is like as 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 much as i probably am still more Marxist than anything else. Like Marxism surely didn't get us where we need to be. I think kind of also as well with the algorithmic expression is talking about like, you know, when you tell someone or, or you're teaching someone about justice, say, and you're a teacher, they can tell you about justice, but they're really teaching you an algorithmic kind of, infinity and in do you know what i mean you've got more to understand about that concept and things like that do you know yeah they're like it's it's this and it's like no it's not it's not this it's this and we're, we're only approximating it yeah even them they're not going to be able to like totalize even their their own feelings in the world they're not going to be able to totalize that like you're going to take something from their speech that maybe they didn't even intend. Yeah. Well, and then that, that too, like, so the face and like expression, the expression of the, the thing that is doing the expression itself. Like there's a lot of content that I include that I'm, I'm like, there's latent content that, um, 
it's it's there and if you're taking everything as like this like mathematical formulaic approach like you're going to miss out on on the content that's there um soda versus pop like i like i don't know there's there's content there that i take for granted because i call it soda whereas someone else may call it pop and sure that's probably a silly example but um there's meaning there like there's meaning being conveyed and it's, it's, it's almost like this kind of like we, we you know multiple infinities isn't there it's yeah. kind of like you come across another and it's like oh my god this person is infinite and i thought i was infinite and now there's an there's another whole infinity coming along which is kind of a weird thing and i suppose i'm not sure if he's getting at that actually if that's what he's kind of getting at because that's like um something in mathematics isn't it anyway yeah th there is like um like even when it when it comes to the idea of infinity like infin like you can you can understand infinity but once you try to put it like a label on it then you're already diminishing it um and i think there there it there is a lot about like uh or that there's a lot of interplay between like mathematics and analytics and this idea of infinity um and I like I I think it resists it and it's resilient to the mathematization the mathematization of everything the the uh the arithmetic that the world operates on. Um, but I also think it could probably be useful like for more analytically minded people. I do think like yeah, infinity versus infinity plus one. Like the, there's yeah. these different gradations or different qualities of infinity um and like the 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 notion of infinity and then the notion of the other and then like the other is an infinity but there's an infinity of infinities out there and it's yeah like it really does enter this like non-euclidean um space that it gets reduced to mysticism or it or gets conflated with mysticism and like i don't know maybe it can be helpful to some people but i think it i think it cheapens it to to just reduce it to mysticism like or just to reduce it to mathematics like no it's it's above and beyond both it's it's outside of it that's the thing like it's it's alien and we are aliens in this alien world, and everyone else is also an alien. Um, You're also an alien to yourself. Yeah. That's just what I wanted to say. So it's like, when I go to say something to you, you catch some of what I'm putting out, but I even surprise myself when I'm speaking. So it's like, even when you try to like signify something, or you try to... I think he's just building on that as well because he's like, okay, I'm talking about it in like signification. I'm talking about it when the analytics do their arithmetic. There, there's no way to completely totalize something in a sense. I mean, you can if you like reduce them to like the atheism and other stuff, but he's just trying to say like properly speaking, it is infinite or you get to that like reductionism to where it turns into like language games or it's like oh why does the meaning of life question bother you it's irrelevant it's not a real philosophical question and it doesn't follow from logic it's okay that's a logical expression but there's still that like excess that spills over in your human feelings that can't be reduced to a truth table mm. it's almost like i suppose when um that you almost you can accept the infinity in yourself very easily, but to accept the infinity in another is really difficult. It's a really hard thing. And you get yeah. mad if like somebody acts differently, like yeah. for your partner or something. It's like, oh, you're not the man I married. And it's like I'm not the you're not the same person you were five minutes ago. But it's like you expect I, I people to be confused. I always think of like the thing. Like, imagine if your if if your best friend turned into the thing, and he just like all these tendrils came out, but you still had to hug him. You still had to kind of love him. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of what we're trying to do here, I suppose, is trying to love the thing, 
Yeah, like, it, we, not we are the thing. Like, that's the thing. It's not imagine if your best friend turned in. Like, no, your best friend is the thing. But nevertheless, yes, yes. he is your best friend at this, or they, they are your best friend. Like, yeah, we are all the thing. Um, I think it's interesting, like, the, like, the relation to the self is kind of predicated on the other, but, like, then we use the other as a prop or, like, as a stand-in, um, I don't know, it's, it, the way he treats, like, the self, the, like, identity, I think that's interesting, too, that previously I never really thought about. I was just like, oh, yeah, it's all about the other, it's all about the other. But, no, I, I think he's also saying, like, there's a relation to the self, there's a relation to our own identity that, um, that gets instrumentalized in, in the same way that we reduce and, and like, t totalize others. We do the same thing to ourselves, um, which I didn't, like, I never thought previously was in Levinas, but I'm kind of picking up on it this time around. Yeah, massive. That's something I picked up on as well, that, you know, if, if you have a totalized view of yourself, you're going to totalize everyone else around you. It seems almost kind of simple after you've read, read Levinas. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You think of yourself as a soldier or a standing reserve or something like that. Nance, I have a question for you. Yo. Is I, I I've heard you guys mention this idea of uh uh is it virtually purposive? Virtually purposive, um, yep. Per virtually purposive. And um would you say this has any bearing on uh maybe what is meant by infinity? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a, maybe they're synonymous, like being, being virtually purposive is like, uh, like an open-ended teleology, throw out the word teleology. Cause I think that's just confusing. Cause it's definitely not a standard usage of the word, but like you as a virtually purposive being you're you, but you also can't like contain your future in this way. Like you can, you contain the unfolding of your future. So um, like a, a little kid in the street isn't just a thug, drug dealer, bad criminal. Like he's also his, his entire future. So he could be the next president. He could be an ax murderer. He could be a really cool guy. He could like, he could be anything. So like, um, that's kind of the idea of infinity, like the infinity in the other, um, I don't know what would be lost by saying they're interchangeable, but I, I don't think they're interchangeable. I think there is a distinction, but I don't know what that is. But yeah, like it's, it's the same idea. Like you're virtually purposive because you, you include your, your future and your past. Like Heidegger would be more concerned with you containing your past. And Levinas is like, yeah, but you also contain your future. Like, um, which is, I think, my my problem with Heidegger and why I think Levinas does such a great job of, like, picking apart the functionalism that Heidegger winds up doing. Because Heidegger is trying to escape functionalism, but I think he inadvertently finds his way back to a functionalism by focusing on the history and, and, and the destiny or the fate. Um, and Levinas is, his idea of fate is, like, it's, it's the infinity. Like, yeah, it will happen. It will come to pass. So we can, we can take it seriously because it's going to come about. Like, the world isn't going to end right now. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. So, like, we can, we can bet dollars to donuts. The sun's going to rise. The world is going to continue on. And you will be something other than you are right now. Um, but rather than it being like a fate that's going to culminate you and your identity... Levinas is is like no it's it's the infinity that like you're going to move into and you're going to continue moving and I'm going to continue moving and Bucundity? 
possibly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, fertility yeah the 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 future is is pregnant with itself man or whatever like a kind of ultimate creativity that we've all got mm. in infinity i'm not sure if there's some connection between those two things he he does talk about like interpretation like the endless interpretation and i think that does have to do with creativity because it's like you're not taking it as this concrete thing you you are reinterpreting it as it like as you encounter it as you the actual being in the world encounter this thing you're always going to reinterpret it and reinterpret it and your interpretation will always differ from my interpretation um so yeah like this this endless abundance of creativity of interpretation and interpretability um and natality like yeah i think there's a lot of what a rent kind of goes on to do is definitely here in Levinas. Yeah, it's definitely here in Yeah, I haven't read a rent, so I don't know what what connections do you find there. Like the the ethical relation with the self where she kind of goes on and, and she's like, it is, ethics is like, how do you live with yourself? Like, that's where you can kind of derive your ethics. Um, and Levinas is, is doing that. He's just saying it in different words because it's not like, how can you live with yourself? But it's, it's like, the other will kind of see you for, for who and what you are. Um, and you don't want to be like you don't want to have a, a net negative impact on the world. You don't want to be seen as having a net negative impact on the world. Like you want to actually honor the other. And I think like that's the same thing. It's just seeing it from different angles. Um and I don't know, it's 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 weird when it comes down to judgment and guilt and shame because these words have connotations today that they didn't have when Levinas was writing, um, at least in in French um, or in German where he was studying. But it's, yeah, it's like this sense that we have by virtue of being the I. And like, because we're the I, the I also presupposes the other. And so it's this weird, like, tautological thing where you could almost do this infinite regress but they're Arendt and Levinas are both like yeah well we don't need to do the infinite regress like we're always already there similar to Heidegger like no we are here we do find ourselves here so we could doubt it and we could be skeptical or we could just roll with it similar to the the Descartes thing like where Descartes like I can doubt everything but the I and then Levinas is like yeah sure but what is that I? Like that I is the thing that is being called into question by the other. So the other is more concrete as opposed to the I being more con concrete. I think it's kind of seeing the same thing from different angles. Um, I was going to say something else. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. The, like the self-relation is, is interesting. Um, Yeah, I have to read Arendt. I think um, Christopher Post something like solicitude seems very other focused as well. Did you feel like that connected? As well? I don't know. If... Uh, just because Hannah Arendt talks about at least the reading we did for the CMT about solicitude and kind of like being together with the other in a sense. So it's like there's solitude and solicitude. And like solitude is it's like you're content with being with yourself and like introspection and other things and solicitude is kind of like what we're trying to do right now in a sense. So it's like we're connecting on a deeper level and just surface thing. And it's like, if you see the other as infinite, you're not gonna like be like, oh, I expect will to be this, 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 and this. And like, I'm elsewhere and expecting you to be a, like, sort of like a present at hand will. And it's like, no, instead, like I'm here with you and we have this space. So I was just thinking that could be a connection as well. 
Yeah, I think it, it like uh, seeing others as objects of concern, mm. um, as opposed to seeing like seeing others as others and and really being there with them. I think that is like you can't have solicitude to a hammer. Um, so only when you allow the other to to be in this metaphysical position can you truly care for them which is solicit yeah solicitude is ultimately like you're another human and i care about the fact that you're another human um and yeah you can't you can't do that when you're totalizing people you you have to allow them to kind of unfold as infinities but yeah the the idea of infinity versus the infinity of the other. I think that's what we that's what we wound up talking about on Thursday night for a long time. Like this distinction between like just radical alterity and then like uh radical alterity contained in a concrete other. Um I don't know. I don't I don't know what the danger is in like using them interchangeably. Other than like if you want to have like this logical unfolding, like no, it's the encounter with the concrete other that then opens you up to this notion of infinity, but then you always come back to the fact that yeah, the, the it's the infinity that matters. Um I don't know. But yeah, people people are people. And like, definitionally, being a people is that you are this this infinity thing. It's just crazy to think too that Arendt and Levinas both were very like focused on Heidegger, and they both are addressing such a gap in Heidegger's work, but they still have that like foundational respect. Like that part, it's not really like related to the book per se, but I just think it's fascinating to see how like they can just go down a similar road so far different than like their their master at the time, so to speak. It's just something that I find kind of interesting because yeah. it's like they're more focused on, and it's funny too because they're on the complete opposite spectrum of uh, World War Two. Yeah, they were Jews. <laughs> they, they were persecuted yeah. Jews. Yeah, I wonder, I don't know. I, I think that, that conversation mm -hmm. is, is a very interesting conversation. And I, like, I think I have definitely been unfair to Heidegger. Like, I think Heidegger, every, like, yeah, read Heidegger. He's, he's important. He's one of the most important thinkers. And I know, like, previously I've been a little, or I've seemed a little, like, dismissive of Heidegger. But no, I think Levinas couldn't do what Levinas did without Heidegger. Like, it's... It's very Heideggerian in a sense. He's almost continuing the noblest parts of Heidegger's project and correcting his his failures and his mistakes. Um, it's same thing with Hannah Arendt too. Like she she fucking loved Heidegger. Um, but it gets to a point when I don't know. It all it all seems to stop making sense. Um, and it starts to feel like, oh, I'm, I'm being the mystic now. I'm, I'm doing the mysticism. Um, it's hard not to though. I mm -hmm. feel like, cause like some of my favorite philosophers I'm drawn to all at some point, like literally broach that path, like Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Levinas, Plato. And it's like, it's just, you get so deep into this that you start to realize like okay hold up like but then again it's like then it becomes even more incomprehensible and it makes it difficult to like be like oh read totality and infinity so that like we see what's going on with palestine is worthwhile and somebody's like what are you talking about this is like mystic philosophy so it's kind of like hard to walk that path sometimes if that makes sense i didn't mean to cut you off though i'm sorry have have you no I I love it. Um have you read Martin Buber I and now? I I started listening to it on Audible. I don't know. It's pretty good. 
yeah i think it i think it's great i also don't know if it if it's worth reading um because mm-hmm. i th- like it's i like think a short listen yeah i think levinas is doing what Bo- boober thinks he's doing and like the the i and now thing it's like i do it i i do that shit to my car like instead of like being mad that my car is broken when my car is broken i try to think of my car as like this complex system that has needs and i'll be like well what's wrong with you car instead of like you fucking stupid piece of shit um like i think it probably did really change my life when i when i read boober and and started doing this i and now thing but that's like that's like this the silly mystical version of i think of like levinas is like no dude like you can't be the solipsistic like just hungry needy acquisitive creature you are that you are this needy grabby consum- consumption machine that's what we all are that's where we all start but in order to like elevate yourself from this animal nature all it like all it involves is just realizing like oh p- other people have needs too and my actions affect other people and like there are consequences there's the ripple effect from the things that i do um so it seems really simple but it's also really complex and deep and makes you question everything maybe i don't know is there anything I, uh, does... oh sorry go ahead go ahead caesar oh i i potentially might change the, the subject so if he has something to respond to that no 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 it's fine go ahead in subject um so uh yeah i've i've attempted to read boober i and thou um like a second time like just last month and uh still got distracted and, and never ended up finishing it but i felt like the thing that him that his text and what levinas is doing is they are trying to emphasize how things in the world can have this uniqueness to them that is uh i guess in, like in boober's case i think he is the tree uh where um yes the, there is tree and it could be uh i can think of all the concepts and the ideas of tree and yet if i'm looking at one specific tree the I thou relationship to it is this is this tree. It's its own unique tree separate from all the other trees. And that would be the I thou, I guess, perspective of looking at it. And so that makes me think of Levinas uh saying, Well, yeah, every every being can maybe have like the shared uh kind of universal aspects of some sort like coming from a i don't know like one one source of everything and yet the tree or you know the other still has its very unique otherness that is uh its own um and um i i was thinking this is one of the questions i think or something that came up when dave was talking in the lecture about having if you were to have someone be your little puppy dog human um where you can make them do whatever you want um and yet he was saying that levinas would say that you ultimately can't possess possess them fully and i'm i'm just getting a whole bunch of lacan lacan uh well maybe psychoanalyst uh um I don't know, meats and potatoes from from this because it's making me think, okay, maybe the thing that you could co- totally control in a puppy human would would be their conscious. You could take over someone's complete conscious if you wanted to, but could you take over their unconscious? Is that the remainder 
the excess of 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 a unique being that you can never fully um, comprehend. You can never fully have uh, control over. And so that's just kind of a question already of like, okay, what is this thing that we couldn't fully possess of the other? Um, at least that Levinas is claiming, because who knows? Could you actually possess it? Um, it seems seems like something to think through. Yeah, I I uh I like contrasting Lacan to Levinas. I think uh, like desire, metaphysical desire, as opposed to like Lacanian desire with the objet a, like. I don't know. There, there's a lot there. And then also like, yeah, language, language being the house of being, um, language being the world that we live in in the world that we the see in, like we, we, we don't perceive in language, but our interpretation, like we, we always take our interpretation for granted. So yeah, like tree, I'm always thinking of, of this platonic form of tree, but no, it, it, it is that singular tree. And that thing, it just that river, you know, the, the the river is never the same two times ever. Like everything is is this infinity. Um, I don't know though. The the unconscious with Levinas. Hmm. I don't even wouldn't know if he. That, sorry, wouldn't you say that the the other is behind the unconscious? That even the unconscious is something which is kind of structural, you know. Yeah. You need to sit with like a language. Yeah, like I don't know. Almost that, that. Almost that. Like the infinity is like more primordial than the unconscious, or like yeah. re like the unconscious is kind of resting on this because the unconscious is still conditioned by by the world and language and um. I don't know. Those. Th I think that's a good question. I think that actually would probably be a good paper. Like, yeah, massively a good paper because there's loads there, isn't there, to kind of pull out. Like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think now. I think I think there's a way to graft psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis, onto like a Lebanazian metaphysics. I do, but I think it has to be done that way. I think. It has to be this metaphysics, and then the Lacan would have to be bolted on later. But I think it can be done. Yeah. I wonder what we would lose or what we would gain. I'm not yeah. sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, what would we lose when we had to try and put those together? Because there's something in Lacan that doesn't fit, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, I, you know I, think, I, mean? I think for Lacan, like, it, it is lack. It is, it is this desire uh, in, th that operates in this way um of its oh it's your object ah that's like trying to be satisfied and since you can never actually have the object ah like you're always going to fail and your libidinal economy is going to get hooked in like i i think the fact that he posits this primordial lack is what's wrong and i think the way to do it is by like for levinas it's a primordial surplus or excess and that's why it can't be satisfied. That's why it will not be satisfied. But because we live in the world of language, um, it, like this, this lack is so easily incorporated into language because language itself is lacking. Like when you make the jump from this metaphysical I to this worlded I, I'm already l losing like the encounter with the surplus. And because I have to live in the world, I have to pay bills and do things like I'm forced to turn my attention from the surplus to the lack. And, and like, that's, that's how that, or that's how I think I would do it were I to try to like combine the two. And I, I do think it can be done and I do think it, it works. Um, and I think it's because language and our relationship to language which is why it's so interesting, like when he when he's talking about this algorithmic reproduction, I, like I'm just like fuck yeah, dude, tell me, give me more of this, like, because I think that's it. 
yeah there really is something in that paragraph yeah, yeah absolutely um you have something then but i've kind of forgotten it um oh that's cool let me know some books unfortunately unfortunately i i have to dip out but um it's been good talking and uh i just wanted to leave us with um unfortunately i've been i've been that teenage boy and listening to the smiths a lot this week and uh i just have a, a lyric that stood out um maybe talking about relating to levinas and uh the other and it's uh it's from the song hand in glove and it's called the lyric is no it's not like any other love this one is different because it's us hell yeah dude <laughs> <laughs> That takes me right back to being a fucking teenager, longing for that one girl. <laughs> well, all right. See y'all. Hell yeah, man. Peace. See you later. Bye, Susan. Bye, Susan. Have you read these books, Christopher? The Between Levinas and Lacan? No, I just, I was curious, so I just did a quick search on Amazon. The first one, the reviews were saying that uh, there's like a missed encounter between them, like in the book itself, but hmm, the I'm second not... one looks a little bit more pertinent. I'm probably going to see if I can get a, a copy of it online just to look at. I'm just oh, not as well-versed in Lacan. Mari so Rudy wrote that one. Harder. Oh, nice. But it's just kind of pricey, so I'd recommend looking elsewhere. But yo ho ho, matey. It, yeah, exactly. And then it's just kind of funny too, because again, it's like Lacan went through Heidegger. So it's like you just have this one formative thinker and all these different. So that's why I think these people are so important, which Dave hits on this all the time. It's just because it's like what what is gonna come out of the reader? Who reads this and is like going to come up with something and it's like if you're able to bridge the gap for example between Levinas and Lacan that opens up a whole new school of thought and all kinds of just stuff in a time I think we need yeah just so polarized um time energy time energy theory like Dave Dave's thought is very Like now that I have more familiarity with Heidegger, with Levinas, like it's, I can see, oh, okay, this, this is where this emerged. Um, and I think like, I think time energy theory is, is radical, right? The, and, and the fact that it's, it's asking a question and it's like demanding more of the future um, and getting us underground theorists, thinkers, radicals from the internet, assholes, like whatever the fuck we are, like it's, it's getting us to realize like it is up to us. The responsibility is on us. We, we share a radical responsibility. Um, I think that's, I think that's a different part of it. That is also radical. So you have time energy. That's kind of like, okay, let's, let's try to think outside of capital. That's one side of it. That's radical. But the other side that I think is even more radical is the radical responsibility. Like it's up to us. The world's on, the world's on fire. We're doomed. We're all going to die horribly. Um, and because we see that, like, let's fucking put our big boy pants on and let's do something about it. Let's try to theorize the moment instead of, um, running away from it. Uh, and yeah, that comes from Levinas. That comes from Heidegger. That comes from uh, Lacan via Mikey, like in the way Mikey breaks down Lacan. Like, I, I don't give a shit about Lacan, dude. There's like a couple Lacanians that I give a shit about. Mikey being the first one, Todd McGowan being the second one. And like the, to hell with the rest. I don't care about Lacan. Um, but we, yeah, like we already have like emerging an emerging milieu. Um, and I think it is due to due to shit like Levinas. And, it, and it's, it's just that realization that like you, 
you're an agent, you're a rational actor, you, you are whatever you are. Everyone else is also that. Nothing can be totalized. But also, we all share responsibility. Now, taking, this is why Marx matters. You, you can't do any of this shit without Marx. Because then it turns into like this stupid libertarian bootstraps ideology. So like we, we always need to start with material conditions um, and, and think structurally. But that's, all, like, that's also not enough because that gives us Trotsky. Like, I don't want Trotsky. I, I want something more. Mm. Do you think there's something with um, uh, time energy specifically? Because when I'm explaining it to other people, um, they kind of, their mind opens as soon as I, I, I kind of explain that we've, we've kind of got to focus on everybody's time energy, not just specifically poor people or something like that. Is that a Levinasian term? because that's the thing that really makes people go, whoa. And then they, and they suddenly understand it. And someone kind of misunderstood what I was saying. And then suddenly they, they, I saw them kind of think through it and they went, oh, that's actually genius. But anyway, I don't know, do you think? I, I think so, because it, like, you can't, playing the violin in a vacuum is meaningless. It, it is playing the violin the reason that matters is is because the other. So I do think it's a Levinasian point, um, because yeah, w without that, without that commitment to the relation, it just becomes self help. Like I'm gonna be the the coolest, best motherfucker in the world. Like okay, do that in a vacuum while you know babies get their heads cut off and the world burns and uh, the the rest of us fucking starve. Like, see how fun it is to be a violin virtuoso when everyone is gone. It's like that Twilight Zone episode where the guy wakes up in the future and everyone's dead and he's in the library. And all he ever wanted to do was read. He's like, I never have time to read. He's got all the time in the world, but his glasses are broken. Is that the world you want? Or do you want to, you know, do you want to live in a world where, sure, you have to, you know, do some chores. You have to wash the dishes. You have to clean up after yourself. But then we get to read books together and we get to truly discuss and have discourse, like proper discourse, rather than just like instrumentalized rhetoric that, uh, that reifies pre-existing categories or pre-existing uh, circumstances. I think it's super Levinasian. But I, uh, I don't think I ever really like hystericized myself on that. I always just kind of took it for granted. Like, oh yeah, of course it's a common resource because I'm coming from like this uh, Marxist position. <laughs> you know, we're not free until we're all free or even like an anarchist position. Um, but yeah, it being a, uh, it being part of the commons, because labor is a part of the common. Um, labor power is a part of the commons. Like people take for granted just like with libertarians, like, well, what about roads and what about schools and, and fire departments and stuff? Like how, how libertarians always miss like the, the common labor element. Um, of course, time energy is, is part of the commons or else it, it wouldn't be able to be reduced into labor power the way it is. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that also, I really, really need to read Marx. I'm not, not, but then I, I, okay. I think, yeah, I think probably everybody and and look, it's not like you have to read the three volumes of capital, but like having, having an understanding of the problem, I think is essential. And, and it, it just always gets boiled down to the fact that we are, prior to birth even, we're all already totalized and instrumentalized. And the reason for that today is capital. In the past, it wasn't always capital. In the future, maybe it won't be capital. But as far as it stands, the reason we are locked into a destiny is capital. And that's not to say we can predict what's going to happen to people. But like, yeah, depending on where you're born, there's a limited set of possibilities. You're not going to come from an inner city and be an astronaut. Sorry. You're not going to come from the inner city and, and be the president or a senator or a congressperson. And, you know, you're not going to come from the suburbs and um, 
experience the things that those same people are going to experience. Like we, we have a limited set of coordinates on the board and that's due to capital um, and the way it, it like hijacks material conditions. Um, God, and then that opens up like the question concerning technology. Like, is it technology that's doing, doing this to us or is it capital? Um, which is why, yeah, dude. And I, I think, I think it's all the above, dude. And I think language is the tool that it uses. Um, which is why I, I like Lacan, which is why I like Heidegger, which is why I like Hegel. Cause they, they have interesting thoughts on language. Um, but I think Levinas is the most exciting just in, in that one brief fucking mention of language in the, it's algorithmic reproduction. Like that shit gets me going. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel like there's loads there that we still need to kind of mine in a way. I feel like there's something there that, I don't know, we haven't quite got to yet. Yep. But I don't know, maybe in, infinity, maybe we're just never going to get there. I don't know. Dude. Well, it, having the, um, the poise to accept that, like it, it is an infinity. We will never get there. But that doesn't mean to give up like it's it's still a worthwhile pursuit even though we already know we'll never we'll never summit the mountain but it's still a mountain worth climbing um mm -hmm. i th i think i think that's like included in levinas like i i think you have to be you have to have that position of like i will never know this thing but nevertheless i must try to know it um and honor it and like respect its presentation respect its expression this was one of the things i was thinking about like um not being a doormat for levinas not letting it make you submissive and isn't there something in, in the fact that he's asking you to be ethically dominant in in a kind of bdsm relationship the dominant is meant to actually like the submissive almost kind of carves out the space for the dominant in a way like the submissive ends up controlling the dominant. Hmm. So he wants a dominant who makes a space for the submissive, who makes a space for the other. I, I don't know if there's something there rather than, you know, allowing yourself to be a doormat, but you're actually allowing yourself to be ethically dominant over, over another. You know, the ideas of dominance is to care for another, really. It's yeah. it, and the submissive, you know, because I, I think we're in a world full of submissives who want other people to dominate them. 100%. And there's no one who will actually dominate others in a proper caring way. And I think that's almost what Levinas is saying. And that's how you're not a doormat. Huh. It, you know, you dominate in the way of the, uh, you know, a father is to their son or, or you know, in, in, in those kind of ways and in, in a caring way. Hmm. I don't know. I think, um, I think there's definitely something like, I think it is a forceful position it's like no i like you you have to you have to be forceful in, in order to open up this ethical space in the world because we we're not we're not allowed to act ethically like we, we are it's not personal it's just business like that slogan is the slogan of the 20th century and the 21st like so you you have to you have to be resolute and say i will enter this ethical space so I, I think there's definitely forced, like a forceful entering into the relation. Um, dominance and submission. That's interesting because it, it is almost like a, like a different type of, um, I don't want to say ownership because it's the opposite of ownership. Like it's, it's like, no, I, I don't possess you, but because I don't possess you, I'm holding you up or something. I don't know. I don't know. That's what, isn't that what a dominant does to a submissive? Yeah. The, the, the submissive ends up carving out the whole kind of um, erotic relationship. They end up being kind of the thing that's held up, the thing that, that's kind of cared for, the thing that ends up kind of, that the, the dominant plays the part for the submissive in a way. Mm. So I don't know. I, I just feel like there's something there, like not, you don't want to be a submissive where you're basically like trying to get the other to do what you want. You're being a dominant to listen to the other. Yeah. To listen to the other. They're most vulnerable and they're most caring kind of in 
way, I suppose. I don't know. It's like or it's like uh, it's like solicitude is the opposite of solicitation. Yeah. Like like if when you're soliciting, you're trying to get someone to do something for you, but like when you're in solicitude with another, it's about the giving and it's about the holding open of the space. I was thinking about like politicians and how they're like, we serve you. And that's what like the relationship is supposed to be. So it's like they're playing into that, but they don't do that. So it's like they're being dominant in the sense where it's like you give your power to them to look after you. But then you are the doormat because they're not taking care of you. So it's almost like Will's saying you want like the honest politician who's actually like serving you when you give them that space that like opportunity in a sense like you're letting them be master but it's in a sense to like be a caretaker in a sense yeah it, yeah yeah exactly exactly like you know it, you know in order to be a master you have to care for the other right? yeah i mean yeah, yeah. I, I think with that like you could even like that calls calls you into question by like forcing you to uh to be capable of like honoring and, and respecting and having like the strength, like, no, I am human and I am resolutely human. And because I am, um, you know, human, which can stand in for strong, virtue is good, like whatever, because I am this, I can do this thing. And it is a feat. And, and like, it's something that should be celebrated, which is an interesting take on, on the verticality. Um, not in this like Bordeauxian sense, but in like a like a Nietzschean or a Sloterdijkian sense, like, um, like we are we are heroically, uh, holding up the other so that the other can be all that they are, but that's kind of contingent on the fact that we are capable of doing so in the first place. So it's a weird self reflection thing. I don't know, man. There's so much more here than i honestly than i than i thought before like i was just like oh yeah be cool like that's levinas just be cool and then suddenly yeah it just blows open his mind yeah it's the benefit of this format and then reading together because like you're saying you're getting different minds with different interpretations and life experiences it's like you could buy a commentary and get one person's interpretation. I'm sure they're like writing to many of us, but it's not the same thing as like somebody in the trenches with you giving their perspective. So I like that. Cause like I tend to be more cynical and like pessimistic. And I feel like you're similar, but you still have optimism. And then it's like Cesar and Will are like bringing in a whole nother side. And it's like, oh, okay, let me, let me follow that train of thought. So I think that's a wonderful aspect of this and what it's a, this space is supposed to be because it's like like dave was harping so much in the beginning of the lecture it's like it may not sound like it's loving us but it's like it's actually practicing what we're reading and i think that is just as important if not more than and we do we do all the approaches obviously like the line by line and other stuff but it's just important that's why i'm thankful for this space and i think it's important as the world burns to like have other people be like hmm this is what i think and then it's like my buddy listened to you read time energy for example he picked the audible one and he was like listening to it and he's like i fuck with this he's like i may not be able to read all these other books but i can still get a feeling for it and like it makes sense to me and it's vocalizing what i feel inherently but i can't necessarily articulate so i think it's important yeah, dude, like, I think, I think the practice is not even just as important. I think the practice is more important than the reading. Like, you can sit back and, and read it all, man, and, and know it all. But like, if you don't put it into practice, then you're a part of the problem. Fuck you. You're just masturbating. At yeah. That point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully, one day they'll, yeah. like, feel ashamed of themselves and That's stop true. masturbating. Russell Brand, when he was talking about that, had a bit about that that I wanted to, like, I'll see if I could share it in the Discord where he was talking about, like, 
I guess teen. I'll, I'll close with this. Teenage boys in England were like literally like jerking off on like students' backs to like be like ha ha ha. And he's like, the second they finish though, they're probably like, oh my god, man is mortal. I'm gonna die. I'm a horrible person. And he's like, how in between that are you like? Ha, this is so funny. And he just went on this like existential monologue about it. I'll see if I can find it. But I was just thinking about that the whole time. And it's like Dave's nailing it on the head. But it's like just this vulgar example. The the iniquity of man. Like that's yeah. that's that sums up the human condition yeah. right there. I'm gonna masturbate on you and then cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good choir Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll be the that'll be the subtitle of, of my book. I would. <laughs> I'll, buy, I'll buy five coffees. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I am going to go. I got to go do a bunch of shit. But thank you guys. Um, I'm going to be thinking about this the rest of the day, probably all night, too. So, same. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, Peace. Nice talking. Bye. See you later.